Hello everyone and finally welcome back to another one of my videos. Yes, I know it's been like 8 months but basically after I made my Raspberry Pi CCTV video I started working on my version 1 e-bike which can be seen in some of the shots from this video. After that I basically lost interest in the Raspberry Pi project uh, so never made the second part. I also intended to make a video on my e-bike version 1 but that never happened either. So this is the beginning of a new series on my latest e-bike version 2. Enjoy! A few months ago I came across this specific hub motor which offered the best price to power ratio I could find. When it finally came it was a little bit battered but nonetheless I couldn't wait to cut it open. Once all the flaps were open I could catch my first glimpse of this beauty. The black powder coated surface was superb to look at. The mounting bolts and washers also look super rugged but we'll have a look at them in a mo. Getting it out the box was a bit of a challenge as it weighed about 8 kilos which is quite a lot for a bike wheel. All the protective packaging could come off which clearly protected the rim but not so much the sides of the box. Having a closer look we have these three very chunky phase wires that should be more than enough to carry the current we need. There is also a connector for the hole sensors which I'll definitely be using at some point. These are the mounting bolts and washers as well as the disc brake mount. The rim of the hub is 45mm wide which is very big as far as bike wheels go and there are the usual holes for adjusting the spokes. On the other side there are the same nuts and washers as well as threads to attach a standard freewheel. By the way this is the 3 kilowatt motor from Alien Power Systems which would certainly be fun to use. There was an accessory bag which was tied to the spokes and needed to be cut off as well as the main cable which had a really durable sleeve that should provide plenty of protection for the wires and in my excitement to get it off oops. There was also nice attention to detail with the sensor connector and here are those lugs again just to show off how beefy they are. The hole where the cable connects to the motor had a bit of wear on it but shouldn't be affected too much. Inside the accessory bag were all sorts of useful spare parts, such as these torque arms that can be used to stop the motor shaft rounding out the forks. Look it up if you want some more info. There were also these standard washers that can fill out any space if needed. For some reason, a second hall sensor was included. Not quite sure why though. And finally, an extra pair of spokes was included just in case something breaks further down the line, which is always possible. Moving on, this is the bike I'll be using as the base. It's a full suspension mountain bike which has pretty bad brakes, okay Shimano shifters, terrible front forks, rim brakes which work, just about, standard cranks and a front cassette, rear coil that can be adjusted, back wheel and derailleur, another terrible kickstand, and of course a seat. Why get a bike of this quality? Because it only cost 10 quid on Gumtree, that's why. The first step was to remove the nuts that held the old rims in place, which was easy with the help of a ratchet socket. The wheel then lifted out and the chain could be moved out the way. After I got past the rim brakes, I then realised how chunky the nuts of the new wheel were as my socket was nowhere near the right size. With the correct size though they came off easily and I had begun the long process of fitting it in the frame. First of all I thought it would just slot in but how wrong could I be? The forks were much too close together as you can see here so the motor wouldn't fit into the slot. Instead it was resting on the main part of the shaft and not the threads on both sides. To make things easier I took off the rear brakes with the appropriate allen key and then tidied up the chain as I didn't have the correct tool to remove the master link. First I measured the gap between the frame to see what I needed to do. Now warning, bending the rear of the brake by hand is stupid and can completely muck up the rear of your bike. Even now one fork is bent slightly more than the other. Then it got worse. At the time of making this I thought it would be better if I could apply more force by pulling up on it from the ground. 
It widened the gap, but it still wasn't anywhere near enough for the motor to fit into. I still had the same problem where it wasn't actually getting into the thread, it was just resting on the side of the motor. I then tried pulling more. Yes, I am cringing at myself now. And even tried to make up the uneven gap by pulling one side and then pushing the other. Luckily, I realised this was a bad idea when I saw that the paint had cracked on one side, but not on the other. Even after that, the gap had only widened by about 5mm and it needed to widen by at least 10 I then went out and bought a 2.2 inch continental tyre with some decent grip as well as an inner tube to go along with it. After a bit of research and common sense, I knew I needed to put down some protection between the inner tube and the spoke holes. Although not the best choice, I used some masking tape as it's quick to apply. I thought about using duct tape as it's thicker, but thought it might be too permanent. If you know a cheap alternative, then put it in the comments below. As you can tell from the next bit, I've only changed the tyre twice. So initially, I tried putting the inner tube on first and then pumping it up. I then found that I couldn't get the tyre over the top, so I took it off and put it inside the tyre. Once I got the valve through the rim, it was then much easier to use a combination of prying and stretching to get it to fit properly. I'm sure the bike specialists have a much better way, so please do let me know. I pumped it up and then it was ready for later. Now this normal looking rod is the part of the idea I had to widen the dropouts in a more controlled and even manner. It has two wing nuts and the old nuts, which I'm using as washers, that can be tightened outwards to push the frame apart. Once it was in the dropouts, I tightened it on both sides so that it was just making contact with the frame. I then measured the distance to see what I had to work with and began tightening the nuts. I tried to do it slowly so as to give the metal time to adjust. The last thing I wanted was for the frame to crack, although there's a small chance of that anyway now. I was constantly measuring the distance to make sure I didn't overshoot my target. For the last bit, I needed the help of some pliers as it had got pretty tough by this point. And yes, it did take about half an hour. After all of that, it was time to see if the wheel would fit in, and it didn't quite. To make it softer and easier to fit on, I took some of the air out of the tyre, and this time, with a bit of wiggling, managed to get the shafts into the dropout. It still wasn't quite a perfect fit, so a file sorted out the small amount of difference on one side. With this modification, the wheel fitted and spun freely. Hooray! Now I knew the fit was in check, I took off the tyre to make the motor easier to test. So that I could test whether the motor actually worked, I mounted it in the bike and made sure to secure it with the nuts just in case something backfired, which luckily it didn't. This is a glimpse of my old e-bike which I'm using the Veskin battery of to test the new motor. Just for testing, I'm connecting up some crocodile clips to the phase wires for ease of use, and as I'm using a Vesk, I also connected a USB cable to alter some of the settings. The first parameter I changed was the voltage cutoff which I lowered to 15 volts as I was using a different battery from normal. The next one was the max current which I limited to 20 amps which would be more than enough just to get the motor spinning. One of the safety features of the Arduino board is that it needs to have the key turned on in order to use the throttle, however to bypass this I just used the wire kind of against the point. And here goes. The stuttering is because I don't have any sensors connected yet. and I was pretty happy it all worked. To make it even quieter though, I went through the process of setting up field oriented control, which, noise warning, is a more complicated way of controlling the motor, however does reduce the noise. The setup process involves measuring the resistance to the motor as well as some other features. Here is the before and after. This here is the battery compartment for my previous bike with a soft power button and a key switch. As I mentioned earlier, I'm also using a vest, 
specifically the Vesk 4.12. The black block is a heatsink I added to manage thermals and will definitely come in handy with the power I want to run this setup at. On one end is the XD60 connector and the other end is three ring connectors that can bolt onto the phase wires. These are the hall sensor and USB connectors. To keep the motor wire out of the way, I used some reusable zip ties to attach it to the frame. With it being full suspension though, I might have some issues with cable flex or tension, but we'll see. Now this lovely shot of my head not only shows, well, not much, but also how the vest connects to the motor with the bolts. Now if you're a pro, I'm sure you have a better way of taking the grips off. I've also heard of using compressed air, but I don't have the tools for that. In the end, I used some oil to loosen it up and it came off no problem. Next I took off the throttle grip from my old bike with an allen key and put it onto the right hand side of the bike which is how it is on motorbikes and how it feels most natural. This wonder here is an Arduino based control board that I built that connects to the VESC and has headers for the throttle, regenerative braking, the key switch and an LCD which will eventually go all in the 3D printed enclosure on the handlebars. At the moment it gets a speed, power and distance data over UART from the rest and then plugs into the main connector like so. The battery cable also fits through the box like so and the throttle cable is then tidied up on the frame. The battery I'm using at the moment is a 5S 3 amp hour battery that can put out about 60 amps. I used to have 4 but annoyingly they all died so I can't test the full power motor until I get some new batteries. Even at the moment it still sounds awesome and on that note let's have a test ride. This wasn't at full power, so that's why it's not got great acceleration that's anything particularly special. Even so, it proves that the setup works and I'm certainly pleased that it all worked out. If you want links to the motor at the best to use, then there are the links in the description to the site. Here's a bit more testing and first person filming. So that concludes the end of part one, however this time I promise there will be a part two. Hopefully next time I'll be upgrading the batteries or building an enclosure for everything to fit into. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, comment down below if you've got any future video suggestions and I'll see you in my next video.